this is a first for this workshop, but not a first forever. But I think it's the second Fret King I've seen. Uh, one was Malcolm's, and it was, uh, it was in this Paul style. And this is the Fret King Country Squire Tally style beastie. Lovely dark uh, fingerboard ebony or something very dark close to it. Um, double bound hollow body um, half bridge two pick uh, two pick up yeah two pickups uh, wide what's this one is that a single coil or a humbucker well it's a humbucker isn't it it's a wide range or something that type of thing anyway um, and this has come from Ian um, actually bought at a pretty good bargain um, you can see it's it's a it's a delightfully made thing. Um, lovely satin neck with a kind of rounded over whoops sorry rounded over business here like some of the old tellies and obviously the fret king headstock um, so this is a wilkinson trail wilkinson product really um, and it's the top of their or top of the line they're making some other ones no actually it's still the, probably the top of their line um, anyway so yeah and this this the this has come down for um, a bit of a quick changeover, and I've, I have to say I've done this already off offline, off camera. Um, it came down with a concentric dual pot here for what, what was originally a rotary um, coil split, a progressive coil split, but mm -hmm. but it was very tall and got in the way. And actually, the, the truth about it was, um, let's just make sure I'm running up there. The truth about it was that um, it was pretty much on off. There was no there was no meaningful rotary, um, no progressive tone at all. You were you were either single coil or you were full humbucking, um, straight you know between naught and two maximum. And in fact, it was probably even less than two. So um, we came to a, a different solution. We I put in a, a micro toggle switch. This cuts the so up is um, uh, I can't remember now. Single coil down is humbucker. Um, and we've got volume and tone and the standard switching. So what else needs doing with this thing? Well, we're going to, I'm going to change out right now. Um, I'm going to put some different strings on. This has come down with nines, um, but I'm going to put on some uh, tens. But before I do that, let me get this to stay in. Stay with you. Um, the, the nut is a ooh, very, it's got different levels. It's been cut hmm, more than once. Uh, yes, I hadn't really looked too closely. The question was going to be, do we, um, do we fit a new nut on this or do we not? Oops, and as we, if we give you a close up look, close up look, you see those slots are pretty deep. Um, and they've been cut after market, I would say. That's okay, somebody's been going for a nice low action, but if you look, if I can stabilize this long enough, and it's very hard to do it. Um, if you look, that B string there has practically no space at all under it. That is fractionally too low. Um, I, my, my take on this would always be, if it isn't broke, don't fix it, but, um, you know, you, you can probably see that the start point of this nut is not fantastic. Um, there's some bit of damage to the whoops, bit of damage to the finish behind there. So I wonder if that's been chipped off while somebody's been doing the nut. What you can see here is um, it's <laughs> six o'clock shadow. Um, that looks disgusting. I think that's um, uh, wire wool filings so I guess the owner is giving the giving the frets a bit of a clean up. Um, as towards as towards as to the frets they're all pretty good. Um, nothing stands out and actually it plays pretty well even at the sort of lowish let me just zoom out lowish action that I would be wanting to set. So let me just move things around so I can see. Yeah so um, I think I think that nut has got to 
go. Um, is it too low? One of the things I did notice about this, it's got nines on, which um, Ian wants tens, so we're going to change those. And so I'm going to start by just slacking this off and having a look at how easy it is to remove this nut. Um, it is a tusk nut originally, but it has been adjusted and it's now too low here. Um, yeah, it's uneven and low. So with these nines, actually I'll take them off completely because I'm going to put some cheap sacrificial tens on, even though there are nines on here that we could have used for the same uh, purpose. Let's get rid of them. We'll put tens on just to fit the guitar off, get it with the same loading on so we can just complete the setup. Now the question is, is with the tens on, what will it be? How will it be in terms of uh, bends and chokes? It's pretty good. I've got to say this, if I don't find any uh, fret slap and I don't find any choking, then you know it may be that this wins the, wins the, uh, it goes through without any problems award. And that's okay. Um, you know, what I've done is uh, I've done the um, rewiring bit, so that's, that's good. Uh, doesn't look properly intonated, I have to say. So let's dump these off cuts. <laughs> I was watching Dave Simpson the other day, um, and he's great, a great YouTuber. Um, and that my heart goes out to him at times. He's very, he's very open and honest about how he feels about certain things, particularly it's a bit buckling on this uh, scratch plate here. Not much we can do about it. But yes, he's, he's, he's a very honest and um, very straightforward about his his emotional state around gigs. So he has a he has a feature called um, you know gigs from hell or something like that. Actually, I'll get something a bit not as long as that. Um, yeah, so I was listening to one of uh, just hearing hearing him explain how how quickly his um, his state of mind was kind of uh, knackered by um, hey, uh, by things going wrong, and you know he talked about a particular. Uh, yeah, that's, that's a bit. It's a bit old shaggy, that isn't it? Um, talked about how you know, a particular uh, gig from hell and everything broke down, and <laughs> poor guy yeah, had to take himself off and and find some peace and quiet to try and get himself together again. And uh, I, I I just um, I try to think about even when I've done performances, and they're not at the scale that Dave does. You know, he's a He's a, a skilled player compared to me, um, but I'm not sure I ever take it that seriously anymore. And maybe that's just something that comes with age, and I'm obviously older than him, so maybe that is. But and look, when 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 I hear somebody struggling like that, I, I, I wish I could give them the, whatever perspective it is that I have. Um, that stops me worrying about it so much. But uh, it's it's impossible to do that. So if, even if I was keeping that, by the way, I would cut all of that down. That was That's what I got these here blocks ready for. I was gonna basically take off all this excess material. Um, so so the, the difficulty, well, the difficulty here is I'm, I've got a flat slot and I've got a 10 inch um, radius, that's okay. This is a nine and a half inch nut and that will pretty much suit it perfectly. Now it almost drops straight into there, um, but of course it's going to be quite a bit too, um, what's the word, tall to start out with. Um, also looking at the spacing of the strings, they're, they're just about spot on. Um, so I'm gonna to need to uh, bring this thing down to the correct height. Um, and it's slightly difficult not as easy as it could be because there isn't this um, 
it's got a it's got a foot in the middle. So I have to bring all of it down at the same amount to get it to fit. And actually, it's a very very shallow slot. Um, it's a nice it's nice to be fitting at the moment. A little bit too wide, but that's what you get with all um, tusk nuts. Now I can't really take this as a guide in any way because it's um, it's uh, basically slots are really deep. Um, what I, I can do, I don't know what that noise was. I can do is I could probably just about measure where that's going to sit. Three point three, and this one's currently. Well, it's not even straight, is it? So I'm going to have to. Well, there's two ways I can do this. I can either put this in and cut down until we've got the correct height, which I think is a real shame, um, but we're too high at the moment. Or we sand it down, um, and eventually what will happen is we will bring it down. I can start using it here. So I'll bring it down to a flat based nut, and we'll probably get rid of this little foot and the middle foot at the same time. And then we get a little flattening at the edges as well. What I'll do is I'll just take a tiny bit off the... Um, oh, that's you buzzing phone. Tiny bit off the thickness overall, which means it will slip, slip in perfectly easy. Right, there's my fit. A bit more to take off the ends. Um, what I'll do is I'll put my, for now, I'll put my cheap springs on. Thank you for... Uh, I think Adam, these are Adam's strings. They're going on as sacrificial strings. Um, that's going to take forever, one by one. Um, yeah, so I can load this up under correct load. Let's put it there. Rubbish. Anyway, yeah, so I've been enjoying watching. Uh, Dave Simpson, and uh, I love that. I love how he, he does those long jams, and I I wish I I wish I felt confident or able to do that. I, I, it's a bit of a pity, really, having no playing on the channel when I fix guitars or set them up. But it's just, I'm sure a lot of people who do a similar thing to me know how that feels. You know that. Um, it's very difficult to just suddenly start playing something. You know, even if you know something, then you get hit by copyright. And if you don't know something, or you're making something up and improvising, then you, you know, have to play along to a backing track or come up off the cuff with something Hendrix-like in its freeformness. And it's well, I don't have that ability really. So it's. I think he does a great job of that. And I loved watching one the other day where he tested out the uh, Squire Bullet Strat, I think it was, and it was the simplest guitar, cheap, very cheap, about 105 quid or something. And he was absolutely blown away by how good it was for the money. And, you know, what was clear to everyone who watched was that, you know, you take a basically capable guitar and you add someone like Dave who plays it with such passion and commitment and um, you get a great output um, and it is so much in the player um, anyway I'm going to get I'm going to think I'm going to get my screen driver thing right, thank you Just to hurry oh it's one of those okay thought I was going to hurry it along but Still got to cut these short. So with the split posts, I go past two, two past the one I'm winding, and then put it in and start winding. Long way. So it's what day is it today? It's this 16th of 
February. And I just came, came from home and Claire's brother, twin brother, rang from home in the States and was talking about coming over um, in the summer or early May, I think it was. And Claire was having to say, I don't think there's room for him and, and um, his daughter to stay because there's guitars everywhere at the moment. And I don't think it would be any different come May. It's, it's a shame really. I think he, I think he really wanted to stay at ours. Um, but I, I've got so many guitars around the house at the moment. Um, I suppose it's a glut at the moment, which is good. But I've, I've just run out of hangers. Um, probably because I've got my guitars on hangers, but there's a few customer guitars and hangers. But then a lot of them are in lying on a bed in the spare room in their cases. Safe me out of the way of everyone and everything. Um, but yes, it's going to turn people away because there's, there's too many guitars. But I'm not complaining. It's uh, nice to have a lot on the go. Ooh. Oh, and one of the things I'm very happy about, um, some of you may remember that I was making an extremely wide six string guitar for a customer who I've done a couple of wide string, wide, wide neck guitars for. And um, I've been, as a neared completion, it had taken a very long time for various reasons. And as I came towards completion, I contacted him by our normal channel email and I just hadn't got any reply for, I think it was nearly six months and I had started to have to accept, I thought that I was going to have to accept that he, he wasn't able to continue and take the guitar and he, he paid for all the materials already so I wasn't out of pocket and only and to a degree, I suppose you could say, with the work side, of it, the labour side of it. But anyway, um, but I was m more concerned than anything that it was okay. I, you know, a, a couple of really loved guitar customers have passed away in the last couple of years, which which is a which is a strange thing to think of, but it's true enough. Um, so I'm just looking down here. So this is. Let's have a look. I mean, I mean that's because these are in different funny places at the moment. Okay. Yeah, I think the string, the nut position needs to be flush at this end and take the excess off this end because it's nice, nice spacing down the neck. So I'll just knock off the additional material to get rid of. Anyway. Um, one last chance, I remembered that I had sent, well, I, I'd sent a couple of things to his address. Um, one, one of them was the jig for testing how wide his, his fingers needed it. So I made this custom jig um, and I sent that um, parcel force and I thought, oh, maybe I've got his address in the parcel force thingy. So I am, um, how am I going to do this? How am I going to do this? So I try and do it, if I try and do it that way, I'm going to end up running out. Now let's just start by seeing how the height is. Anyway, yeah, so the good thing is, is I went through my sending, parcel force sending, found his address, wrote him a letter and sent it and um, a few days later I got a reply and he's alive and well and he just hadn't been uh, accessing emails for some reason anyway I was just I'm totally thrilled so um, he's he's got to get kind of money things a bit sorted out um, but I think that in a couple of months time that ultra ultra wide six string guitar is going to go to its intended home finally which I'm really thrilled about uh, otherwise I mean I, I was sort of going to end up putting it on eBay and 
reverb or something. I'm just leaving it there for however long it might take. Right, so I have got the nut here and it's running a fixed action. So let's measure what the first fret action currently is. The action down this end is where I want it. I've already set it. Um, and I'm going to look at see what we've got on both sides. So 0.7, 0.7. Good guess. I reckon that's going to be about 0.8. Probably 0.7.8. So it tells me sort of an idea of what I've got to take off. 0.9. So a bit more off the base side. Five, five and four and two. No, three, four and two is nine. 0 0.7. 0 0.9. That's about a mil over that way. Okay, let's call it. One mil and 0.7. One mil to begin with and 0 0.7 on there. So we want to get down. Okay, we'll, we'll do it. How will we do it? Let's see. It's easy to, much easier to calculate with a flat bottomed nut. But um, funny enough, Tusk don't make flat bottom nuts. They make they do, sorry. They make 12 inch radius flat bottom nuts, but they don't seem to make 9.5 inch radius flat bottom nuts anymore. So that just gets a bit tricky. So what I'm gonna do is, I know, I, I know how much I've got to take off. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna measure my actual nut. Where has it gone? I'm gonna draw my nut over here. Mm -hmm. Bit in the middle, I don't really care about that too much. I've got a measurement I'm going to take there, and a measurement I'm going to take there. So the measurement I'm taking and the treble slot end is 399. It starts out at 399, and on the base E, this little fly or spider trying to get me, on the base E, 357. Okay, so I know I've got to lose 0.7, uh, 0 0.4, minus 0 0.4 on that one. And on this one, I've got a minus 0.7, minus 0.7 there, which means the target on here is, uh, let's call that 636, minus 7 is 29293. 2.93 is what the target measurement is there. 399 minus 0 0.4 equals 359. Or well, 360 to be on the safe side. 3.6. 2.9 .9 and 3.6. 2.9 and 3.6. So now we do some sanding down until we get 2.9 and 3.6 as measured here. 3.6, 2.9 on the center. Right, so what I'll do is I'll use this nice flat piece of brass and I will continue my straight up and down sanding, waddling from side to side so I don't move the orientation of the nut. And hopefully I keep it as upright as possible. And then I can measure. Now eventually this probably will, um, it'll take out the little, um, if it goes, if I cut any further down, it will take out the little leg bit, um, and then we may well end up with a flat base. But we shall see. It may not have to go down that far. Three point five. We want two point nine. So again, I'm going to keep on, keep on sanding. The key in this is not to move the hands and just move the body. And keep the hands firm and that, you, that way you get a much better chance of a perpendicular cut it isn't perfect but it's equal on both sides at the moment which is good good going um, i'm doing this because i prefer to do this than to cut the slots down right 3.6 is the target we're on 376 and here we're target is 29 we're on 335 so yeah th this is preferred way 
of doing it so that we don't have to um, cut downwards into the slots. That one was cut down and you know it's fairly ragged. Um, I don't know what you can see here. It's fairly ragged but it, it works um, but I'm if I'm if I can I like to preserve the factory slots since they are uh, clean and smooth to begin with. Could if you wanted to put pencil marks and then on the bottom and you'll see where it cuts down to the flat part. Three seven five and three two four three seven five so still more to go. Um, okay so I'll give a, a little example. I mean it could be pencil, it could be pen, it could be heaven or it could be hell. So if I Draw some stripers on it. We'll see how far off being flat we are. Stripes, stripes, and then put it back on. Hold it down. Rock from side to side. Oh, let go of it. Uh, you can see that little bit still not horizontal completely. So, but we're getting there. Um, and then we can check again the dimensions. 3.68, we're nearly there on the treble side. 3.17 on the base side. So I'm going to need to try and put a tiny bit more um, pressure on the base side. It's quite difficult to do with something as small as this and keep it straight as well. But if the base side needs to go down a little bit more compared to the travel side, so I'll do that. Yep. Three six on the travel side, two nine on the base. Three six, five, three eleven, three oh nine, close to it. Now just for our argument's sake, we can put it in the slot. Yep, that's fine. So more on the, still a bit more on the base side. Just keep it going side to side. Like I say, difficult to hold it and do that harder on one side, but you sort of can do it if you're very careful. Almost completely flat now. There's the tiniest bit of pen left on there, and then we go treble 3.6, 2.93. I'd say we're on the ball there. Now, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to take some excess off the end. Square-ish. Drop it in there. Let's see how it feels protruding. Which end and which end? That's smooth. That's over. So a bit more to do. Mm -hmm. What I always do is when I do. Uh, trim a nut like this, I always try to round off the edges left behind so that they just aren't dead blade sharp. So. Whoops, get in the slot. Okay, that looks good there. That looks good there. Tiny bit off the treble end now. Balance it all up. So you see, these are just sacrificial strings, they're just going to stay on here 
for any fret leveling. Okay, so now I've got the nut on at the right height. Let's, um, let's get a tuning fork and tune this up. Slight zing out there, but that's it really so far. Whoops, the nut's gone sideways. That's all right, and glued it in. So what I'm really looking out for now will be fret slap on the lower strings. fret is just and probably a fraction high and there's some slap on these two and that's at the 1.5 millimeter height that I've set it at it actually came lower than that so what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a very light leveling to just alleviate that fret slap and make it play as cleanly as is possible at the chosen action so I'm just going to Wake the strings off again one more time, which is why they're sacrificial, so I don't mind constantly um, putting them on and off. So then I'm going to mark up where did I put it? It was here a minute ago. Mark up the um, pen thing. Yeah, good condition frets. I've got an, another one, another telly 
at home, which is um, the owner um, got it new and uh, noticed a high fret, a couple of high frets at the top, and used uh, a piece of plastic and a hammer to sort of tap it down, um, which improved it. But then it turned out that the plastic had dinged the uh, frets. So see whether it's um, fixable or whether it's something that's a bit beyond saving. It kind of depends, to, for me, it depends on the amount of fr uh, fret wire that we're starting with. Um, if, it's, if it's kind of quite a bit like this, then at least you've got a chance of getting any uh, dings ironed out. But uh, if they're low, then it's far less um, doable. And it may make sense to refret it. But I'm hoping I'll be able to make it play better without the refret. Okay, so I'll just tune up again. thing to check before you embark on any fret leveling is to make sure that the basic action is where you want it. So I know that the playing action here is where I want it um, on the first fret because we've just done that. I'm now going to double check the last fret playing action as I call it. Um, some people prefer to talk about um, 12th fret that's fine I just tend not to that's just my personal thing but it isn't right or wrong either way okay all the way across Now the tuning isn't strictly necessary. It just needs to be close to a pitch. Just to put the right amount of force on it. Right, so let's do this very light leveling. Um, we're using this with fresh, some fairly fresh 400 grit paper on it, being used once. It's like, it's like the lot, uh, lottery, isn't it? We're using a set of balls, number three. Oh, sorry, the <laughs> first fret action, last fret action, and neck relief. Now this has a tiny bit, it's very flat, but it's a very good neck, so I think it should allow us to play flat. So let's treat it that way. Um, again, that, the, what, the thing about the flatness of a neck is that the curvature on the neck, it's going gonna, it's gonna to get pulled that way. The neck is going to be pulled into a curve by the load of the strings. That's its tendency. Um, and the, I guess the first thing to say is that the, the truss rod is its purpose is to allow you to control the amount of curvature in your neck. So the default situation is that you put strings on, they put a certain amount of load onto the neck, and as a result, the neck then bends in whatever, however much it bends, you know, because of the loading you've put on it. Um, if it's too much for your liking, then you're in a situation where you can use the adjuster 
to dial out a bit so it's not quite so curved. You can bring it flatter so it feels uh, a little lighter action to play. Um, but when you're flattening or curving the neck, your consideration that's going on is about how much room the strings need to spin when they're struck. And of course, all strings will spin. This is looking quite good. There's a, it's cutting all the frets pretty much. Um, a couple up here, a bit more than others. So there's a little bit of a double hump going on up here or just a bit of a cluster up here. And then there's a low spot at the end um, which is fine. They, they, we know they're playing pretty well as straight notes, so I'm only going to just lightly go over these and, and that will be enough. Um, it's the, the time I'm going to get cr critical is as we go across into what I call the G track, which is where the bends sometimes choke out, so we can make sure that we clear those up. Now, when, whenever I level, the thing to, well, when you level, the thing to check is individual notes all play. Beautiful. And then we expect to still choke out because we haven't done the G track yet. So I use the same calibration on the next track, the V track, and again very lightly. Um, kind of more, more gravity than anything else. And the 400 grit, you can just see it starts to cut the top of the fret removes the, um, what do you call it, the <laughs> marker pen um, and it sort of, again each time we do a level it tells us a little bit about what the state of thing, state of affairs are. Everything's cutting fairly evenly. Um, there's, a, there's a bit more here and here but that's actually looking quite good. So. When I don't do much leveling like this, it, I'm, I'm using it. I know there's a bit we can improve. There's a blemish on the fingerboard there. Um, I'm, I'm, I know there's a little bit we can improve in terms of the slap and that those chokes as well, that choke as we bend across there. But actually, in, in many ways, um, I'm doing the rest of it just to see any problems and iron out any tiny problems as we go across. But it's hardly doing any leveling at all at this stage but we might do a little bit more as we come across into the from the G and then into the wound strings department. Now this is kind of telling me it's a fraction too curved now so I'm going to ease off the curvature a tiny little bit. The adjustments are really tiny um, and the ability to kind of know when it's exactly matching the curve is born out of experience. Um, I mean, you can get it, you can tell it has to touch all three points simultaneously, um, and then it's matching. Um, so you can you can get it straight off, but you, you get used to it and it gets very familiar after a while. Okay, so I know the G is the area that has to typically be more accurate than any other track so far if we want to just iron out those zizzings as we get up in the high register of frets. So kind of can do a little bit more effort in leveling there. Again, it's telling me pretty much the frets are the same general condition as, as they've been coming across. But now, uh -huh. there you go. Ta -da! That little bit of leveling in the G track has just eked out and cleared up that slap, uh, not slap, the choke on that high bend up there, which is great. So not much done, um, but it's cured that little problem for the action that we've chosen, which is my standard low action of 1.5 on the last fret, low E, across to 1.2 on the last fret, high E. And don't get offended if I measure or I take my readings from the last fret that just suits me but you don't have to do that yourself you can set your own workable action that you like to record at the 12th fret that's absolutely fine I'm not saying it isn't the right thing to do I just have a preference for doing it my way and whatever works for you is by the same token absolutely fine 
Now, as I come across into the wound strings, again, I'm checking them all and it's giving me the same sort of state of the nation. It's all cutting the same amount, which is great. And again, each one, I want each note to play. I'd say there's a tiny little bit of zizzing going on in the lower register, but it, this could be no. It's it's not that it's not that the uh, neck is flat, um, which it can be if you get that kind of slight buzzing zizzing in the first half of the neck. It can be that you're either flat or or convex, but in this case it isn't. So I think we could just focus the attention of the truss rod leveling beam down here just a little tiny bit in the first half of the neck and that's what I'm going to do and hopefully that will just sort out that little tiny little bit of zizz there. Well, if, if that doesn't improve it, then it could be that we are running a fraction flat. But it's funny, it does it more quiet. I'll do a tiny bit more at this end and then move on and as you're doing this you tend to be making a judgment whether you're going to need to um, do a tiny raise at any point if you if you want to clear any um, tiny zizzings or buzzings I call it slap rather than buzz um, but that's a kind of judgment call it always is now tactic casters can can often be uh, slightly uncooperative when it comes to um, leveling. I don't know why, maybe it's just it happened a couple of bad ones that just didn't work with, didn't play ball with me and I've got a sort of block now about them. But telecasters can make me nervous. Just as any maple fingerboard fenders make me think that the finish is going to drop off because it happened a few times, one or two times, two or three times. Right. Now we're into the A track. Now this is where I have, well, we have what we call fret slap. A fret slap isn't a buzz created by individual high frets, maybe a fret that hasn't been seated properly or anything like that. The fret slap is, I've found in my experience, is, um, is, is when your fingerboard generally has a set of up and downs across its length and together those ups and downs, those little hills and valleys, but the hills obviously mainly, um, they take together, take steal away the little tiny bit of space you need for the strings to spin because, because they're wound they spin more. Um, and the great thing about this is that uh, using the, this tool very lightly at this stage on the wound strings, um, what you can do is, is that the curve on the tool can very cleverly take away the tops of those hills in your overall landscape. And by doing so, it just gives the strings back the tiny amount of um, space they need to spin without hitting the tips, the tops of the frets, and it really does seem to work, which is amazing. So it was a it was a byproduct of fret leveling, the conventional sort of, you know, oh look, I've got some high frets, I've got to take them down. The byproduct was that it showed me that there was this kind of thing, which I then called fret slap, which was quite common and which many people. Um, 
mistake for fret buzz, thinking it's a, a single high fret that's causing a problem, when in fact it's the um, it's it's a cumulative effect of the, the, the number of small ups and downs up and across the whole length, and it. What you, the, the nature of this tool is that it's describing right now in its structure a perfect curve and it's coming down on top of an imperfect curve and if you're very light with it the perfect curve sitting on top of the imperfect curve helps you to just chip off the tiny little bits of the hills, the, the peaks um, and create that little bit of extra space so that's quite quite a neat little thing to notice after maybe seven years of doing it this way, it became apparent to me. A little bit there, a little bit right there, but it's taken most of it. So I'm going to focus on that little section there. I'm not going to do anything different. I'm turning the thing around just in case there's any slight difference from one end to the other. And I'm just going to focus on that, I can kind of make the centre of tension, that little area there, and then make sure I get to the edge of the fret as well, so it isn't just on one spot. Um, there we go, and that will be it. So the distinction between fret buzz and fret slap has, been, has become quite important over the years for me, over the last couple of years. Just one. Okay, so what fret are we looking at? Seven. Seven. Let's just concentrate a tiny bit more on seven and then we'll stop. Seven. Now what I'm doing here is I'm putting a little bit more um, pressure down on to, to make sure I'm working on seven a bit more. Of course it's working the other ones a little bit as well. I'm just sort of focusing on seven a bit there more than the others. That should be, well it'll be as good as I think I'll get. So I'll Fine. So that is where I stop with the leveling. And that's, for some people that would be a very subtle kind of reason for doing fret levelling. In other words, did most of the notes, did all the single notes play beforehand? Yes. Uh, were there any obvious high frets? No. Why did I level frets? Because we had a very small bit of choking out on bends and because um, there was uh, a little bit of fret slap over here. And, uh, Doing that cleared those up. So this is as, as good as it can be now at this chosen action. And I have to say, with a very low, um, there's a very low uh, action set here. Not as low as it came with, but nonetheless still very low compared to many things in the world. Just a little bit needed off there, and again I'm going to just round off, round off, two, three, round off the edges. Now, while I'm at it, it makes sense now to glue this down. So it always helps to have the strings nearby, um, because you've got to get it in the right place, right off the mark. So I don't want much glue on there. Oh, thanks man. That's not what I wanted to have happen. No, that isn't. Um, <laughs> am I going to get this out? It doesn't want to come out at all. Okay. I must just accept that isn't going to come out. I bought, um, where are they? They're somewhere. I bought a load of single use um, 
super glues actually because I'm tired of throwing away or wasting a load of glue because it sits in the bottle and then goes stale and hardens and you can't open the container anymore. Just going to tighten these up just for the sake of pressing down on the nut while the glue sets, that's all. Hmm. Okay, so that's in a way that's the the hardest part of the job done, um, the precision part. So the frets have been lightly leveled, very lightly leveled, in order, sorry, in order to um, allow us to clear up the fret slap and have a lovely low action at this end and a flat profile on the, um, with the truss rod. So it's, it's gonna feel low all the way up and down this. So all we need to do now is mask this off um, to protect it and we'll get rid of these strings. Electrics are done. Um, we'll, we'll mask this off. I'll sand and polish out the frets to their shiny. Then we'll give it an overall clean, oil the board, put new strings on, stretch them out and then intonate them and that will be the last bit of it. So I will come back after I've done the sanding and polishing bit. I'll save battery power and see you in a minute. Okay, we're back after the crowning the frets out, sanding and polishing them. Um, so we're ready now to put on new strings. But before we do that, I am going to um, I am going to put some oil on the fretboard. Not much because it's a sort of dark and beautiful thing as it is, but just enough to get going. Little creature. Just to have a personal up close chat. I was just watching a Steve Lukather interview, and by the way, I'm very sorry that the sound in the first part of this video, I forgot to switch the microphone off, so we only had the audio from the overhead camera the whole time, which made a complete mockery of wearing a microphone and all that rest of that. So I do apologize. Maybe it's been a couple of weeks since I recorded one so that might be my excuse or it might not anyway yeah so I was uh, while I was doing the polishing fret polishing I watched a, I was watching Steve Lukather's story about um, Michael Jackson calling him up to to do the solo on beat it beat it and um, it's a great story he's a, he's a very good storyteller and um, I got, I got to, uh, came late to the Toto Lucas game. Um, you know, I, I didn't really, didn't really know Toto much, um, but I found, since found, what a great all-round dude he is, and um, you know, very helpful and supportive of other musicians and stuff. Just a, you know. A nice down to earth, pretty much down to earth character. A sort of success of the rock and roll industry, I would say. Long may he continue to enjoy good health. And I like the fact that he stopped dyeing his hair, kind of followed the Brian May bandwagon and just let it all go grey. Um, and so he looks like someone's kind of grandpa now, which is fine because that's kind of the age he is. Oh, come along. And so much better than pretending to be something you ain't. Anyway, great guitarist and fabulous storyteller as well. Now, I have a little musical trip today, and somebody 
somebody contacted me on WhatsApp or Facebook and WhatsApp, an Indian guy, and he started out by talking to me about Sun Mustangs. Apparently he's from the town where they were made. From the town where they were made. And so we were kind of talking about Sun Mustangs. And then he gave me a link to some uh, some Indian music, which I've always quite liked Indian music, but I never would claim to know enough about it to name anything or even tell you what kind of music I was listening to. But I would sit and happily watch it for hours. Anyway, um, so he sent me this link and uh, so I happily watched a load of Indian music for hours and um, just absolutely superb. It's, I love it when you go off into a type of music that you don't normally listen to and have no preset expectations about it really and you just sort of enjoy the experience of hearing it for the first time. Absolutely wonderful. I was listening to a, a, a performer, a group, I don't know how you'd call it, um, a kind of woman singer in the middle of it and a, a, you know, a drum tableau or whatever it is, player and some women playing tall things with strings behind. Anyway, it, I don't know the names of all the things, but it was wonderful and it was live and it was from, the, I think, um, a, a music festival on the South Bank in London a few years ago, but just wonderful to watch. And the, the whole energy of the singing and the playing, the way the musicians were communicating with each other and the way the singer was communicating with the audience, it's just wonderful, pleasurable. Okay, so I'm just loading up all the strings here. These are Wilkinson tuners, um, and they are uh, split post tuners. I originally thought, when I first saw them, I saw the back of them, and I thought they were the easy lock tuners, but they're not. They're split post traditional looking thing, which is great. I mean, they're a... Hang on, that's got to turn around, man. That's in the wrong place. Um, yeah, so they're, they're, they've got the best of... They, they, you know, they've got good quality because they're Wilkinsons, but they're also got the simplicity of the split post, which I've always liked on Fenders. Come along. Let's just get that plugged into there. That's really weird. How do you get this to go in there? It's got little notches, but they don't really line up. Oh, maybe they just about do. Hmm. Anyway, yes, yeah, so that was a pleasant afternoon listening to some Indian music. But <laughs> the funny part was that the guy, and, the guy and I tried to sort of communicate on mm, WhatsApp or something, and our his... He was using English, obviously, as a second language, and somehow we didn't manage to communicate with each other very well. And he kept sending me kind of messages that I couldn't make sense of. And eventually I had to say, I don't think it's working. <laughs> and then I felt really bad because he, he said something like, oh, um, a lot of people don't understand me. My English friends don't don't talk to me because my my English or something. I thought, oh, no, I've let him down now. <laughs> anyway. I, but I, it got to a point where I, I didn't have time really to keep responding to things that ended up making no sense. So I felt a bit awful about that. But Anyway, I, I was pleased that he gave me a link to some Indian music, which I enjoyed. So there. I'll, I'll say that much about it. Right, let's tune up.
Okay. So, um, I know Ian's probably heard me say this before, but I'm going to say it again in case you're new to this malarkey. Um, tuning, keeping your guitar in tune. Tuning your guitar up is to do with these tuners here. So you obviously turn them to tension the strings. But once you've done that, they have no role whatsoever in the tuning stability or, your, or, the, or the likelihood of your guitar staying in tune as you play. Um, tuning stability comes down to two primary things I've discovered over the years. Um, one of them isn't the tuners. So, so if you've got a difficulty keeping your guitar in tune, do not go out and just buy new tuners because it won't help. The tuning stability is down to two things and it's worth thinking of them as 50% each responsible. So half of it is down to the unreleased slack in your strings, which is what I'm doing now. I just physically squeezed out that slack. Notice how much out of tune it will have gone. Now all of that detuning that I've pulled out deliberately there would left to its own devices would have eked its way out bit by bit. So each string has got a certain amount of tones that it will detune because it's got that much slack in it. And if only one string detunes by a few cents, a few hundredth of a tone, then it won't be playable. It'll, everything will sound out of tune. And, and you've got six strings, all with a couple of tones worth of slack. So there's hundreds of tiny opportunities for your guitar to go unplayably out of tune over the next year or two when you're playing it, unless you get rid of all that first. So my recommendation is that you physically pull all of the slack out. Now, see that? much less now. So the idea is to take hold of it and physically do this, not just once or twice and then go off and do something else, but do this until you can't detune it anymore. And at that point, it's ready to play and it will go into tune and it will more or less stay in tune the whole time. Or if it goes slightly out, you'll be able to revert it, tune it back in and it will just go back in easily. Okay, so I'll do it one more time with my thumb and forefinger and then I'll be done. Obviously, this is quite forceful, but just be careful when you get to the thin strings. If you're on nines and eights, you can easily break it by pushing too hard. Um, tens a little bit less so. And if you're doing it, I always find if I'm doing it on a pair, a, pair, a set of, I don't know, somebody supplied some or bought, paid extra for some premium strings I really take care because I don't want to have to buy a new set. That was interesting. When I pulled upwards that slack didn't come out but when I squeezed pushed the string along its length it did. Hmm. Okay, that's the stretching done. So that's the half of the formula. 
the other half we've already taken care of and that is in your uh, chosen nut that's why uh, I choose tusk because if you want your guitar to stay in tune you need a nut that has slots cut wide enough to let the strings move without binding without friction it needs to have the right first fret action so the notes played down here are true and not going sharp and it, the strings need to be able to move freely um, through the through, through the nut slots and once you've done that then you are you are, are likely to stand a chance of it staying in tune and my experience is the best way to make sure of that is to use tusk which has built-in teflon or ptfe uh, built into it which really helps self-lubricating um, really helps a lot to make sure that it uh, that there's little or no friction I'm just these have been screwed down a bit too much they're really crimping the um, crimping the plastic but it has expanded and it's buckled a little bit under there we'll have to leave that so the next thing to do now is just to check the intonation um, we've got the Wilkinson staggered um, pairs compensated pairs for intonation here so we may should be able to get to a good point of intonation and intonation is a is a physical length business it's it's about how long the string is each string has to be a slightly different length um, what I tend to do is I tend to put that under there to keep the jack socket off the floor yeah so each um each string needs to be a different length so we'll put it in um, um, bridge pickup mode and we tune the harmonic ping to the note so tuning that to an E and then fretting now if the note when I fret is sharp of the E then it tells us that our saddles are in the wrong place So if it's sharp, it means the length of the playing length of the string is too short and we need to pull the saddle back a little bit. If it's too low, or if it's flat of the note here, then the playing length is too long and we need to bring the saddle this way to shorten it. That seems to be on. sharp on the attack and then settles back down sharp I think that one is the E is sharp and that's quite right this is oddly back to front so you probably can see it if you look at it on any right-handed guitar with six strings three uh, wound and three plain what you expect is that the longest one needs to be uh, sorry the shortest one needs to be the high E and everything else from that should be longer now it's hard to see this because they've got barrels don't stand they aren't exactly what we're looking at we're looking at this apex here so if we start there that one is back from there that's correct this one uh, should be back again a little bit and this one should be forward a bit and then this one should be back of that one and this one should be back again so I think we need to go with the middle one we need to go back a little tiny bit sorry about that so I think this one comes back a little bit like so and this one quite a bit more and since it's under tension I'm going to just take this one off tension for a minute so we can get a this one's quite a way off so we aim to get the familiar pattern intonation pattern that we'd come to expect and it goes 
closest or shortest, step back, step back, step forward a bit of that one, step back, step back. And now that's what I've got set there. It's, it's sort of difficult to see. I'll try and show it. Shortest, step back, step back, step forward of that one, forward of the G, step back, step back. And that's the two sets of three groups or two groups of two groups of three. All right, so the next thing I'm going to do is have a look down at this thingy here. And I'm going to have another go and support that. Should be in the same place, yep. Hey. Perfect. So let's put that back. And what's nice about intonating that and then seeing that the tuner confirms what I know historically to be right, and that the pattern that we expect on a two, uh, sorry, three wound, three plane, is always the same, and it always goes in that familiar pattern. It goes there, there, and there, forward of that one there, there, and there. So you can see that it's three there, and three there. And if you don't get that sequence, so that this one's the shortest and this one's the longest of all, if you don't get that sequence, one that say one of them, sometimes you get a string that just seems to be miles out of that sequence. My recommendation is don't fight with it, just throw that string away and, and get a new one. Because it's always the case, almost, well, in fact, it's always been the case in my experience that the string is faulty. And believe it or not, you can get that quite easily. So there we have it the rather on-off rotary um, coils, progressive coil split, which wasn't really working very well, has been replaced with a on-off, um, and everything's the same as before, all in good order. New nut, um, precision leveled, polished out, or recrowned, polished out, sanded and polished out, and um, yeah, ready to go. The only thing I say didn't really show was the wiring bit, but uh, I, was, I was doing that while I was charging up the devices, which I never used in the end, so we didn't get the right sound. So anyway, what a beautiful looking thing. A verdict, I would say, and I'm sorry I'm not going to play this for you, because A, I can't play anything very well anyway. But this, I tell you, this is a quality guitar, and I don't know what you might find them for out there, but if you could find one of these anywhere in your marketplace or on eBay for a couple of hundred quid, 250 quid, I think you would be getting a bargain um, for that. 200 quid, a bigger bargain again. Um, no, they don't have the Fender headstock, but boy, they are a very nicely made, um, classy, quality Telecaster. Um, great. Thanks for watching anyway. Sorry about the sound at the beginning. See you again soon.